Right. Now, the ESA is a large and complicated organisation. Uh, yourselves, ESA members, are the most important aspect. And you're represented by uh, your individual country council members on the council. Uh, there is an elected board, uh, which uh, together the council and the board decide the, the policy. And the ESA's policies and the work are concentrated around a large number of committees, as you can see. So there's a committee for the scientific program, uh, there's committees for research, there's a patient safety task force, there are committees for examinations in the European Journal and such like. And since uh, 2008, there's been a guidelines committee. Uh, there are uh, a number of activities within the ESA for whom education, of course, is very important. And there is an education and training platform which links a number of those together. Again, scientific program, research, and such like. So that's a brief idea of how the ESA works in practice. In 2007, a focus group of council members recommended that the ESA set up a permanent group to work on guidelines. And in June 2008 in Copenhagen, the Guidelines Committee met for the first time. So since then, to start with, we concentrated on setting up our procedures. Uh, we established two task forces to produce individual guidelines uh, two years ago. And of course, this year, uh, we're producing our first outputs. The Guidelines Committee is made up of the chairperson, uh, the chairperson of the Scientific Committee, representatives from the European Board of Anesthesiology, ESA Board, ESA Council, National Anesthesia Societies Committee, and some appointed members with expertise in guideline development. So the current members are, of course, myself, although I'd like to acknowledge the work of our, our President, Paolo Pelosi, who was the first chairperson of the committee and really set it up. Of course, Benedict Pannon, Yannick Mellon Olsen, uh, and the other members as you can see yourselves. Our functions are as follows, to make the rules, if you like, for producing guidelines, select the topics, we have an annual consultation process, uh, choose the people and the experts who are going to do the work for each guideline. Uh, we have uh, invited individual countries to send us their existing guidelines so we can work with them and build on them, to make the relationships with necessary societies and groups, and then define how to get the guidelines in practice, because of course that's the most important aspect. What we're trying to do is to make available European guidelines to, as a service to members, if you like, and we try to make them as practical as possible so that you know, they will actually produce useful advice uh, when you're in the, in the theatre or in the clinic somewhere. Uh, if necessary or if desirable, uh, individual societies can adopt them and, if they wish, change them slightly, modify them for national practice. But really, it's a, society, it's a service to members rather than something that we expect every European to use. Guidelines have the uh, other effect of they, they tend to bring practice together, they tend to harmonise practice uh, and uh, standardise it. Uh, and in doing so, they also tend to improve standards as well. Uh, the, the, the level that you set tends to be a little bit higher than practice in some places, so it, it tends to act for the good as well. The uh, United States Institute of Medicine has defined six aspects of healthcare quality. So high quality healthcare has the following features. Uh, it should be safe, it should be effective, it should be centered around the patient, it should be timely in the sense that uh, the care should be there uh, when it's needed, it should be efficient, and it should be equitable. Uh, by which we mean that every person should receive the same care no matter where they live or what ethnic group they come from and so on. Effectiveness, in turn, is defined as providing the services based on scientific knowledge and not providing services to those who aren't likely to benefit. So we're trying to avoid using inappropriate treatments too often, but also making sure that every patient who needs a particular intervention should get it. I'm sure you're familiar with the idea of levels of evidence. Uh, if you want an intervention, uh, want some research support for an intervention that you're using, uh, the best possible support comes from the levels at the upper end of this table, so good quality randomised control trials or a well-conducted systematic review of good quality randomised control trials. Uh, lesser degrees of evidence are more observational work, cohort studies, case series and so on. 
There are four steps to practicing evidence-based medicine. Again, you may be familiar with these. First step is to ask a clinical question. The second is to look for the evidence to help you to answer the question. The third is to make sense of the evidence, assess it for quality and applicability. And the fourth one, then, is to put the evidence back into the practice. Now, guidelines are useful because they can help us with all these steps. It's a short, if you like, it's a shortcut to evidence-based practice. Another definition, guidelines, have been defined as systematically developed statements to assist practitioner and patient decisions about appropriate healthcare for specific clinical circumstances. But that's a rather dry definition. Uh, the guidelines that I find most useful are ones that are well based on evidence, but also try to answer practical everyday problems and practical everyday questions. In favour of using guidelines are the following arguments. Uh, they tend, as I've said, to reduce variations in practice. Uh, they can be used as standards for uh, measuring clinical performance. They're said to make healthcare more uh, efficient. They raise, raise awareness of a subject in a way that, even if people don't actually follow guidelines, it creates a sort of interest and activity in a subject uh, which the guidelines have been produced in. And as, as I said, I hope, they will be a source of practical advice. On the other hand, guidelines have some problems. For instance, they don't always apply directly to an individual patient. Uh, but having said that, we all have the clinical experience and judgment to relate research evidence to the care of individual patients. So I don't think that's a problem for us. Some people don't like them because they feel that uh, a prescriptive statement limits the ability of doctors to make their own decisions and choose the right course of action for a patient. Having said that, if you feel the evidence is strong for a particular intervention, perhaps you should be doing that anyway. Guidelines can also, if used badly, can allow some groups to impose their priorities upon others. And the other problem that sometimes happens is that the resource implications of guidelines haven't always been thought through. So in the United Kingdom, sometimes we find national recommendations without sufficient money to try to back it up and actually put the guidelines in practice. Do guidelines work? The big question. Well, uh, the, probably the best answer, although maybe not the most satisfactory one, uh, comes from a systematic review of the use of guidelines in clinical practice, which actually is nearly 20 years old now and could probably be usefully updated. So the authors of the review said, we conclude that explicit guidelines do improve clinical practice when introduced in the context of rigorous evaluations. However, the size of the improvements in performance varied considerably. So the answer is probably yes, or yes in most cases, but not quite sure how much. And it probably, as always, depends on the context. Guidelines, in turn, tend to be followed when they're based on evidence, when they're not controversial, when they define precisely exactly uh, what you should do if you follow the guidelines, whether when they're feasible and acceptable, and that usually relates to the fact they've been tested first before they're published, and they don't demand too much of a change in what people do in current practice. Now, most guidelines don't have these features. There's usually something about them uh, that makes them slightly more difficult. 